Welcome to this talk and welcome back to Professor Robert Clancy all the way from Sydney, Australia. And it's good morning from me and good evening from uh, Professor Clancy. Uh, good evening, Professor. Good, good morning, John. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Professor Clancy, of course, is no stranger to this channel. He's a doctor of medicine, a doctor of philosophy, a doctor of science. Uh, he's a various times been a professor of medicine and professor of pathology, consultant, physician, immunologist, and we could go on. So I always learn loads when you come on, Robert. Always great to have you. So uh, really looking forward to this. And one of the things we're actually doing now on the channel is we're trying to move away from um, necessarily publishing new findings through peer-reviewed journals, but um, publishing new findings through actually the video medium and the video format, which uh, Robert's kindly agreed to do for us today. So what's the new thinking that we'd like to share today, Professor? Well, it's wonderful to be here again, John. What, what I'd like to talk to you about and your uh, various guests um, is something I think that's come out of COVID. One of the important things about pandemics is to learn from them. And uh, I'm not certain that we've learned as much as we can and should uh, with respect yeah. to COVID, but yeah. through, through uh, uh, very few people like yourself, John, uh, people are starting to understand the questions and see where the uh, answers should come from. So uh, what I'd like to do, I, I'm, I'm an immunologist, a mucosal immunologist and, and clinician, and I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about an area that is very close to, to what I'm interested in and which I, I think COVID has shone a light on. Um, w before COVID, um, people like myself were very interested in the immune system and how it operated to protect the various mucosal surfaces of the body, like the lung and the airways, or the airways of the lung, and the gut, the reproductive system, and it goes on. And other people, including to some extent myself, were interested in what we call the microbiome. Now, there's no more uh, exciting area in medicine today than the microbiome. I suspect everybody listening today has heard the word, understands a little bit about it, and it's all about those bacteria that sit in the gut. Now, what has happened before COVID is that we had the microbiome research workers and we had the mucosal immunology research workers, and we all went on our merry way, uh, accepting that there was uh, uh, something else that we really didn't focus too much on. But what COVID did, it brought to our attention that, well, wait a second, um, maybe these two systems uh, should be looked at not only more closely, which had be happened, uh, some people were doing that, but as a single system rather than as two separate entities. And this has enormous implications if it's correct, and I'm certain it is, because what it means is that you have a continuous microbiome, that you go from the airways of the lung all the way down to the gut. So if we use the word microbiome, we're talking about the way in which the various bacteria are colonising all the mucosal surfaces. Now, of course, we know they vary enormously because of regional differences, uh, the, the nutritional aspects, uh, the various physiological aspects, immune aspects. And so you don't expect to see the same bacteria in the gut as you'd see in the bronchus or the breathing tubes of the lung. But you would see a continuity of these and they talk to each other, they communicate. And the same with the mucosal immune system. Uh, for example, before COVID, I was focused on um, the, to some extent, the relationship between the airway microbiome and the mucosal immune response. But even though we understood that it was activating payas patches or little factories in the wall of the small bowel, um, even though we were aware of that, we didn't sort of start thinking about it as a generalised system. And I think what COVID did, <clears throat> what we found in COVID was two things. The first was a very simple question, which I know, John, we have talked about quite some time ago, and that is that if 100 people get COVID, 98, 99 of those will have a pretty mild disease. Mm. One or two of them can get very, very sick, and occasionally some of those people will die. Now, if you look at the people, there's no, usually there's no obvious difference. How would you predict 
that that person was going to get a sniffle and that person would end up in hospital. Yeah. So we were able to say, well, wait a second, maybe there's a spectrum of responsiveness, a, a type of resilience. And if we can make a poorly resilient person more resilient, then that's a very effective way of going forward and having a decent type of treatment without vaccines and all the other bits and pieces that go along with them, uh, or in conjunction with vaccines. Quite frankly, uh, any vaccine would work much better if you've got a highly responsive, highly resilient immune system operating in the lungs. So we tested that, you might remember. Um, we tested that in people who uh, were essentially relatively normal people, and we found that about a quarter of people didn't turn on their immune system very effectively. And also, we were able, work that we've been doing over 30 or 40 years, uh, was that the way in which the airways get their protection, it's not making the antibody in the wall so much, it's taking the microbiome, which is in the airway, swallowing it and delivering it to these little factories in the wall of the small bowel. It's an off-site system, leaving the lungs to just worry about one thing, putting oxygen into the body, taking carbon dioxide out. And we found that one in four people didn't do this very well. But if we gave them killed bacteria so that we loaded up this stimulation system, all of a sudden, they all behaved with high resilience. And that seemed to us a very sensible way of going forward. And it really only came as an idea as a result of COVID. Now, the microbiome people got in on the picture by saying, well, hey, wait a second, you've got an infection in the lung, but we're looking at the microbiome in the gut, and it's distorted. Um, it, it's the type of microbiome that we recognise as causing disease. And when we looked at the people with COVID that got this changed microbiome, they were the ones who got very sick and some of them died. And so the microbiome people and the mucosal immunology people started to come together, conceptually at least. Uh, we don't talk to each other or anything like that. <laughs> uh, that's not true. Uh, but we're, conceptually, and we said, well, wait a second, maybe there is a single system where you've got one central component in the gut that's creating the immune system that goes to all the surfaces. And we sort of knew a bit about that before, but we didn't think about it as just a single system. And maybe the microbiome is also part of a continuous system that can communicate up and down through the bloodstream with cells and molecules. And, the, and so we came up with the idea, and this is a terrible name and I'm awfully sorry, John, and you're the first person I've tried this out on, the Mucosal Immune Microbiome Protection System. Now, you have to have something that is trendy, and that's a MIMPS. So yep. here you are, John, it's the first time I've talked to anyone about MIMPS. You've heard uh, it here first, everyone. This is the new <laughs> way forward. In the last time you ever hear of it, but... <laughs> You can, I mean, immediately everyone listening to this will say, well, wait a second, that makes sense. Yeah. That if we're going to treat somebody with, because this is what's happening now in diabetes and obesity, yeah. in yeah. inflammatory bowel disease, yeah. we're saying, well, we're going to treat the microbiome. Yeah. But the, if you've got a system where the outcome of the microbiome is essentially the modal outcome or the, the interaction between, on one hand, the pressure of the infection, the microbiome, and the pressure of the body's resistance, the immune response, then that sliding outcome in one way determines the um, resilience that we were talking about before. But on the other hand, it also says, if we're going to get a better outcome, maybe we should have a dual approach to treatment. Treat the microbiome with everything from probiotics to fecal microbiome transplants, where you exchange Feet. Oh, that doesn't sound very pleasant, but it's highly effective in, in certain circumstances. But combine it with boosting the mucosal immune response. And, and the second immediate outcome, and all this comes out of COVID really, is that maybe if you've got a problem in the respiratory tract, because it's a connected single system, by treating down at the other end of the body um, the microbiome in the gut that's abnormal, 
and there are ways in which progressively we can do that, that may have benefit in the lungs. And there's some very exciting data that, uh, that's come out uh, from a, a Chinese group showing uh, exactly that, that in mice, that that's exactly what might happen. And uh, maybe we can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. So we're getting this idea that there's two components to the immune system. There's a s systemic immunity, which is in the blood and the tissue fluids, which is fairly well known about. That's that's what we teach junior students for, for, for decades now. And then there's this idea that's less well known about the, the, the mucosal immune system. And th these are actually now known to interact and work together. The question that came into my mind there when you were talking is that, that this disorganization of the microbiome in the gut, what we more, might call a, a dysbiota, uh, some bugs out of balance, was that bacterial microbiome being out of balance in the gut predisposing people to severe COVID? Or was it a consequence of the COVID? Well, that is absolutely the $60 or well, 30 pound question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is cause and what is effect? And yeah. this is being, uh, and, and these are the issues that are being sorted out all around uh, the place at the moment. Mm. Um, I think, I think the, the, the study that I referred to in, in the mice was a very interesting one. They gave mice uh, a, a bad bacteria called Klebsiella, which causes pneumonia and would normally kill the mouse. And they found when they gave the mouse the pneumonia, it had this same abnormal microbiome in the gut. Now, it was interesting that the characteristic of this abnormality was a loss of good bacteria. And the good bacteria, well, bug bacteria that were known to make a particular product, which is known as short-chain fatty acids. And the short-chain fatty acids is, are very important because they're probably the first of the, uh, if you like, transporter mechanisms, the, the connecting linkings between the microbiome and the airway. And they're very powerful. Uh, they're secreted by certain good bacteria. They get in the bloodstream and they do good things. Uh, and so what the Chinese group found was that um, when they gave the Klebsiella pneumonia to, to the mouse, the abnormal microbiome in the gut lost the bacteria that could make this, these short-chain fatty acids. Uh, the one they were particularly interested in was butyric acid, which has got four of these carbon molecules. Uh, it, I hope there's no biochemists listening because they might tell me it's three or five, but I'm pretty sure it's four. I think it's uh, four, yeah. So, uh, what they then did was very clever. They gave the Klebsiella to the mice. The mice got quite sick. And instead of changing the microbiome that was abnormal, they gave the mice these a butyric acid, this short-chain fatty acid. And remarkably, the pneumonia started getting better. So they were showing for really one of the first time in a, in a I don't think they realised themselves how exciting yeah. and how yeah. important their study was because it was showing that you've got this, what we're talking about here actually can work in real life, uh, particularly if you're a mouse, but uh, the same almost certainly hopefully would occur in humans, that you can actually use by treating one aspect of this single system affect the other part of it that's pretty exciting isn't it it, it, it really is um it's as, as if almost you're cutting out the microbiome and, and putting in the end product of the microbiome or one of the end product products of it but but of course in, in life bacterial metabolism is so complicated it's probably got a thousand other effects that we haven't uh, we haven't even thought of yet it's always it's very, very complicated, it's complicated very yeah complicated. that's what well, made this th system interesting because it was so simple yeah, in indeed, indeed. Um, one thing that occurred to me there was um, if you have a, uh, a viral infection and, and you're swallowing presumably a lot of uh, viral particles, um, potentially there could be a, a bacteriophage effect there. Yeah. Because viruses, of course, can damage... Well, well, well there's a whole range of uh, viruses that we know are specific to infect bacteria, the bacteriophages. 
And potentially, a viral infection could be killing bugs off in... in I don't think there's any question that part of the communication between the system is actually transit of the virus all the way down the gut. And something like 30 or 40% of people uh, with, with COVID will have gut symptoms. Uh, and in fact, occasionally, they'll only have the gut symptoms. So you can have a patient with active COVID disease without any cough, without any sore throat. Not common, but, but it can happen. And um, I've had two patients in the last three weeks, uh, quite amazingly, that have been diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Uh, now, these patients, uh, one of them got dramatically better when their COVID all settled down and the people involved in managing the Crohn's thought, well, this is fantastic. Whatever I did really helped this person. In other words, they can get these ulcerating lesions that look like Crohn's disease in the gut as a result of uh, and if you look in the literature, all over the literature now, uh, people are talking about exacerbation of Crohn's. But I think now they're going to start thinking, well, maybe what we were calling Crohn's is really a, a, a lesion that looked like Crohn's due to the actual virus being swallowed and affecting the, um, the lymphoid tissue right down the bottom of the small bowel. Mm. And a really horrible disease, Crohn's, can affect any part of the any part of the intestine and can cause, well, potentially life-threatening complications. It's a... Yeah, it, it's a very, it's an incredibly common disease now. Uh, yeah. It's increasing. When I was a student, I can remember as a student, there was, there was said to be one patient in the hospital with Crohn's disease and no one had ever seen or talked to someone with Crohn's and all the students were trying to find this poor patient with Crohn's. Yeah. Uh, these days, um, you know, I'll, I'm doing a clinic in the morning, I'll, I'll see three or four people with with Crohn's, it's, it's really a very common com uh, problem now. And, and most people do extremely well. But, you know, as you say, some people are very sick. Mm -hmm. But an inflammation of the, of the bowel, various parts of the bowel, in, yeah, in this case, probably could exacerbate it or caused by the viral infection. The microbiome getting into a genetically predisposed bowel that can't cope with those bacteria being there. And so they get an inflammatory response to that. And so you have this sequence uh, um, traditionally, uh, we treat Crohn's with an anti-inflammatory, but if you think about that sequence of events, more logic, well, the most logic is to go back and fix the genetic defect. We can't do that at the moment. Yeah. So the next logic is to actually treat the abnormal microbiome that's particularly driving the immune response and inflammation. And there's some really exciting data now. A uh, randomised controlled trial has just been done in America showing very good outcomes uh, of combining the um, different bacteria that act against intracellular bacteria, which are the microbiome not being properly handled by the genetically predisposed uh, defence mechanisms in the small or large bowel. Makes perfect sense. If you if you got a splinter in your finger, you could take some intravenous morphine to dull the pain, or you could pull the yeah. splinter out. <laughs> you're much better dealing with the underlying cause yeah, exactly. of, of the condition as as far as possible. Um, so some people, um, I think I've almost got it now, but I, I know that the connection between the um, swallowing bacteria and swallowing viruses uh, from the mouth into the gastrointestinal tract. How, how does that, because we're talking about specific information here about particular types of antigens. How does that information get from the gut to the lungs and what okay. specific physiological changes happen in the lungs to improve the immune system in the lungs? So first of all, how does it get there? All right. Well, imagine um, we're, we're a bacteria or we're a virus and, and we've, bre we've breathed the virus, you know, we've been breathed in by someone and that's causing a little bit of irritation and inflammation. And uh, as we know we have a microbiome bacterial population and probably other viruses too. And we're swallowing those all the time. Uh, as we sit here, John, um, if we sit here for 24 hours, and I wouldn't do that to you, um, then uh, we'd swallow at least a cupful of secretions without knowing it, being perfectly normal, healthy people. And in that cupful are full of the odd bacteria and viruses that we're breathing in. So these are being delivered on my left. I hope it's your left. There's a yes. terribly basic diagram. And you can see uh, there's a, a pink lung and the bronchi and there's a blue line that yeah. goes with a one on it. And yeah. that's actually showing the transit of these bacteria going down through the stomach 
And if you look at number three, they're the payers yeah. patches in the yeah. war. They're little factories of lymphocytes. And as I said earlier, the the whole way in which this bronchus, these lining um, bronch, the, the the passages through which the air is breathed into the lungs, the way they protect is by having delivered the T cells and the B cells, but particularly T cells, um, these immune lymphocytes coming from the pass patch number three to go to what is basically via, via the bloodstream, which is four, and then five, you can see that it's activating the cells to gobble up those bacteria and prevent infection. And so th this was the first clue that we had that there may be a common system. And then when along came COVID, um, we realised that people are swallowing not only the virus to activate the payers patch there, but they're going straight through all the way down, causing havoc as they go, causing a bit of inflammation, infection in the bowel. Uh, and, and you've got this system where you've got the immune cells coming to cope with it, all coming from the payers patch, uh, some going to the lung, some coming down to the gut. But the virus... And when it does this, it changes, it distorts the bacteria, and so you get this uh, totally abnormal uh, microbiome, which we know in itself drives pathology, causes damage and problems. Uh, and that's uh, what, what, what is going on. And the immune responses try to remedy that and push it back to the normal, healthy type of microbiome that we normally have. Uh, if you look in the... I'll try to explain this, John. It's it's very simple, but it's complicated. If you look at the graph that's on yep. in front of you now, uh, you see a purple line which starts at zero time. This is time across the bottom axis, and the other axis is measuring antibody in blood. Now, if we're looking and we're taking the microbiome from the airway, if the microbiome in the airway stays in the airway, then you're not going to stimulate any antibody in the blood because that's the systemic immune response that only comes into play if those bacteria leak out of the, the, the tubes into the gas exchange part, the alveoli of the lung, where the systemic or IgG antibody system is operating. And so if you've got leakage, you're going to see, and over time you can see uh, from uh, one through to eight, over, I think it's a three-month period, uh, you can see that you've got all sorts of antibodies being produced with very wide standard error bars indicating this is a totally irregular chaotic process. It turned out that only 25% of those, uh, I think it was something like 34 normals and 34, uh, there's 34 in each group. So they're all relatively normal people. I think most of them were smokers, but they were, if you can have a normal smoker, they were normal smokers. <laughs> Um, and you can see that um, <clears throat> about 25%, one in four, was enough to completely distort and create that purple. Now, if you look at the bottom line, it's an absolutely flat line. It's the most dramatic difference. Tiny little narrow standard error bars. In other words, nothing's leaking out of that bronchi those bronchial tissues into the, air, uh, into the gas exchange apparatus to create antibody being made immediately in response. So that we're measuring using the antibody in blood as a surrogate parameter of leakage. Uh, yeah. if, if you understand what, I, what I'm saying, you can... What you're saying is, Robert, I think I've got this now. It's taken me a while, but uh, the, 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 the purple line, the high antibodies in the blood are indicating the presence of bacterial organisms in the systemic compartment, essentially in the blood. Exactly. And that's what we shouldn't have. So if you and me are feeling tickety-boo today, we're fine. We'd be down at the blue line. We wouldn't have the antibodies. That, that's right. And the blue line, where everyone is behaving properly, are people, the other half of the group, that's 34 uh, subjects, are, are yeah. ones that we actually gave micro killed bacteria from the microbiome, yeah. and we're giving them a super-duper dose, and we go to the left hand, and you can see number one, or you can see we're actually giving it as a tablet there. See number two? That's yeah. the tablet reinforcing that process so that the payers patches are now producing highly effective uh, focused cells that will be delivered back to the lungs in a much, so they're more efficient. Uh, and this gave us the idea out, out of COVID that there's a resilience in the airways. Some people are more prone than others 
to actually getting a, a viral type of infection. And if we, if we drive this process, this physiological process, to its absolute ultimate optimal uh, uh, best, then we can shift people in there. We can de-risk them from getting serious COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've, we've shown this in, in uh, other groups of, uh, not with so much, we've shown it with other viruses. So we know it really does work. Yeah, so this is without giving drugs. So we can optimise the microbiome, presumably through good diet and sometimes giving um, probiotics as well. And we can also dramatically improve someone's respiratory immunity just by giving them a tablet with or a capsule with basically dead bacteria in it. Yeah, it's so simple that no one gets it. No one wants to get it because it's just so ridiculously simple. But it is. It's a physiological process made to work at its best. Well, what, what, why on earth, why isn't every doctor in the world doing this? It's, 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 you're giving a simple capsule, a simple bacteria. I mean, they're just bugs that you swallow them. They're recognised by the pears patches. That sends the specific information to boost the immunity in the respiratory mucosa, to boost the immunity in the lungs. And people don't get these bad respiratory infections or they're much more resilient to them. And people with chronic lung disease get less acute exacerbations, what we call Absolutely. acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive airways disease, which yeah. we, and we that's get the area loads of. From. Yeah, before COVID, that was the area we worked in. Uh, with eight randomised controlled trials, it's the yeah. only way that we, you can reduce the admission to hospital uh, with people with COPD, chronic uh, emphysema. Uh, we, we halve the admission rate. Uh, I'll tell you, there are th at least three reasons. I, I could probably think of five or six why um, we're having this r ridiculous discussion. Um, yeah. when it can make such a difference. The first is it's not very sexy. Um, big pharma companies like monoclonal antibodies. They like cloned antigens. I mean, look, at, look at how messenger RNA took over in COVID. A hopeless vaccine, a dangerous vaccine. Yeah. Everyone who really looks at the data and, and it's just coming out and, and certainly no better than a flu vaccine yeah. um, and, pro and, and much more dangerous. But it's sexy. It's sexy. Yeah. Uh, it's the, new, it's innovative, it sounds yeah. scientific, it sounds all clever yeah. clogs. It sounds That's like it's at the cutting edge of medicine, what, but in actual what, fact, it doesn't work. What could be less sexy than kill bacteria? Yeah. Um, we, 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 this is true. This is true. Yeah. Number two, number two. Yeah. Um, you, we've actually got a patent on, on this, but um, by and large, it's extremely hard to patent killed bacteria. Uh, if you have a monoclonal antibody, you have a cloned antigen, you patent the technique, the methodology, and all of those uh, things. And so the big companies don't even want to think about this. They, they hate us with a passion because uh, we cut in, you know, we potentially could cut into their massive, uh, massive earnings. I mean, we're talking about just in COPD, uh, something like a 30 billion US dollar market per year uh, with treatment that doesn't even work very well. And you uh, could potentially halve that, potentially halve we, that. We, we, yeah, we, we, uh, the, the current treatment does not keep people out of hospital. No. We, we halve the admission rate. It, it's all in the literature. Uh, the, 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 the wards are full of them every winter. We have to put them on right. surgical wards because they overflow the medical wards. That's right. And the yeah. third reason is that this is basically a very cheap, simple, safe treatment. Um, <laughs> we've seen a bit, bit of this in, uh, in COVID, I think, John. Um, it's it's um, it's something that you you don't even need a prescription. Uh, it's it's basically it's not a probiotic, but in a many ways it, it fits into that probiotic yeah. over the counter type uh, thing. It's very safe, uh, no 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 side effects that we're aware of, and we've looked at you know literally thousands of people, and um, uh, so you've got at least three things. It's not sexy. Um, the the patent situation. Um, uh, as far as the big companies are concerned, is not in the same ballpark as what they want. Um, and um, it's, it's a very cheap over-the-counter product. It doesn't need to, it's not a prescription product because it's so safe and simple. Mm. Like a vitamin. Could, could, an immune, immunobiotic would be a good description, would it, Robert? That's a lovely term, John. Can we use yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, let, let's use that, immunobiotics. I, I got it from this professor guy in Australia. I didn't make it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, incredible. And and the, the other thing we just need to spell out a little bit, 
is is what specifically physiologically happens in the lungs to improve the immunity? Why is the immunity okay. better in the respiratory mucosa? Well, what happens uh, in the lung is that these T, it's the T cell. We, we got this, we've been doing this work for quite some time. Yeah. And uh, I had a, um, a very talented vet doing a PhD with us at the time. And we were looking using rats because it's a bit hard to do some of this in humans. And what we found is that we could actually take the uh, T cells and the B cells from the pious patch of a rat and we could uh, inject them into the, um, uh, into the lymph... We actually took them from the lymphatic drainage, the thoracic duct, which drains these pious patches, which puts them into the bloodstream. And we purified the cells and we put the T cells and the B cells separately into other rats. And we found, it, surprisingly, we expected the B cells that would be making antibody would be the cells that would protect. But uh, we found it quite the opposite. It was the T cells that were highly effective at, and what they did is they made the innate immune system, the white cells, the uh, complement, not, not complement, the various molecules that are recruited by the specific immune system, um, the innate system work highly efficiently. And so the white cells would gobble up the bacteria and we reduced the, the number of bacteria in humans when we measured uh, in humans, we could reduce the load of bacteria. In other words, the number of bacteria in the sputum of people who are coughing up yellow sputum with chronic bronchitis by one 990 fold. We, we reduced it to one thousandth the number of bacteria. And once you do that, you're making a dysbiotic, a bad nasty microbiome uh, all ready to be tickled by the virus, a much bit of buffer zone to protect you. So we were able to contract down the microbiome uh, to one thousandth the dose, three logs uh, for those who are interested in, in science. Um, and and that's, that was done uh, with, by Mike Alpers, who, who ran the most remarkable uh, of laboratories in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, uh, did this fantastic study. Uh, which is I, mean, I mean, I'm guessing, I, I don't know, I've never read studies on how effective antibiotics are, but I can't imagine that even intravenous systemic antibiotics are going to reduce the amount of bacteria in the lungs by 999 out of 1,000. It's, it's um, well, suddenly effective. Bacteria, they would, but, um, would right. uh, but you know, this is uh, what, what, what the, the byproduct of all, in all the studies we did in humans was that we reduced the requirement for antibiotics dramatically. And, and in a day and era where we're terribly concerned about what's going to happen yeah. uh, with all the antibiotics becoming resistant to so many of the infections, yeah. um, this is a, a simple, safe, physiological way of making... In fact, I worked out, I'm trying to remember, I think it was something that if, if we treated everyone who needed to be treated in a population, we could reduce the usage of antibiotics by 15 to 20 yeah. percent that's that's really quite a, a marked improvement i mean it does make you feel a bit sorry for the pharmaceutical companies who would lose 15 <laughs> to 20 percent of their antibiotic income but uh well we have a product we just need someone to come along and yeah we, we don't, we, all we need is the money to put through the registration and and, and is it, so we've got the whole thing there but you know we're a small group of quasi academics that uh, aren't very yeah. good at business yeah. So if someone wants to change the uh, future of, of infectious disease treatment in a complete, essentially completely safe way, um, the, for, for a relatively small amount of money, that could be done. It just seems yeah, I, to me I, I think no, I'm not, it's not here to, to promote our own interests, but what I, what I would promote is that there is, we have to start thinking of different ways. And I think what COVID did, John, was made us think outside of the squares that we were living in. And it's terrific to have a program like yours. I mean, what I'm talking about now uh, has been published, um, but uh, and only was published after COVID. And it was only, it was inspired by what we were seeing in COVID. Um, but what it's well, talking- Well, published by you, Robert, and we'll put the link to that, of course. <laughs> well, well, it was published. Um, but what, uh, what we're talking about here is a way of, of looking at what infection is 
and changing outcomes without using antibiotics. Uh, and I think, uh, and we're looking at the beginning. <clears throat> what we're doing is pretty crude. You know, we're using, we just, we take the most important, we select out a particular bug that really works well in the system. Yeah. But um, what's going to happen and what will happen with the big companies is they'll work out the specific antigens on that bug yeah. and they'll clone that. Won't be any better in terms of outcome. But this is what they'll do. They'll clone the antigen. They'll put it in a, a, a sexy delivery system and they'll say, look, we've got this huge thing that halves the rate of admission of hospital. Uh, and and it's, we've, oh, we've patented it. And we're going to charge you $2,000, uh, not $20, $30. That, well, yeah. they'll, we, they'll probably make, make it up with, I don't know. That's, that's what will happen. And so there'll be some the, sort of monoclonal antibodies or something like that. Yeah. And in the context of, of the theme for tonight, um, I think we're going to see um, certain different antigens, different bacteria from the gut, all coming and using the same delivery type of system uh, to modulate, uh, and I'm hypothesising here, but certainly uh, we're very keen to look at Crohn's disease, for example. We know that if you take a patient with Crohn's disease and you replace their bacteria with normal faecal, you know, it's called an FMT, faecal microbiome transplant, a number of those patients will do very well. Let's just take a look at that, Robert, actually, if you don't mind. Is this the slide here? Yeah, this one. Oh, here we are. Yeah, this is, this is not my slide. I style it. Um, right. But you can see this is what FMT is about. It, it, yeah. It's been popularized. It was really developed by Tom Barodi, uh, yeah. who uh, I had the pleasure of having as a PhD student. Uh, yeah. Tom is who, one who of I the... met last April. Great guy. Yeah, that's right. He's the yeah. guy who discovered the, the treatment for peptic ulcer, but yeah. wasn't on the Nobel Prize list. Um, yeah. Tom's, Tom's a very, very, very smart guy. He and is. he developed this uh, back in the 60s and 70s uh, and now has taken it to another level. And uh, what it is, it's, it's screening normal, healthy people and taking their feces and concentrating the bugs from that and then infusing it through uh, a colonoscope, which is a tube that you put up through the bottom and uh, goes up into the colon. And you can see, uh, and, <clears throat> and everyone laughed at, Tom, when he started doing this, uh, but he plugged away, literally plugged away, I suppose is one way of calling it, and, uh, and, and then a group in uh, Holland said, well, let, we'll do a randomised controlled trial in a particular disease that was doing so well with FMT called C. difficile. Uh, we started, well, he started uh, treating these patients before it was even called C. difficile. And the Dutch... Uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It must be a very good journal. And the New England Journal published this paper. And the paper, the study wasn't finished because the, the outcome was so dramatic in the active compared with the placebo. They stopped the study and started treating all the placebos with the uh, fecal microbiome transplant. And there was a 95% cure. Yeah. Now, this is a condition that in America today, there's something like, I think it's 10,000 cases a year with three, uh, three, no, wait a second, it's more than that. There are 3,000 deaths a year from this condition. And you C can get death, a 5% yeah, yeah. cure. And around the world now, everyone's talking about it and they're all trying to you know, develop systems to treat. But there's a lot of, this is just the beginning. Um, it, it's going to really go into uh, a much more sophisticated Form. Now, they're doing with FMTs, with the microbiome, what we're doing with the immune system. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is we need to bring these, think of it as a simple uh, uh, single system, and let's treat with both uh, making the immune system work better and putting in better bacteria. Uh, and that's what we want to do in Crohn's disease, because we know that if you change the microbiome and get away from the uh, from a bad microbiome to a good microbiome, many of these people will do very well. And there are now three randomised controlled trials in ulcerative colitis showing significant benefit. So uh, we're, we're just at the beginning of, of this type of treatment. But there's no sophisticated, clever clogs drugs here, Robert, is there? <laughs> That's the problem. Isn't this a bit of a concern? Shouldn't we be being trying to be really clever and need the sophisticated pharmaceutical well, companies but, to do but, clever but, things for us? Well, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. The, the big pharma companies will, will do that because that's where they make their money. They won't be better treatments. Well, they might be. Let's hope they are. But um, they'll be much more sophisticated. They'll be cloned, 
cloned antigens. They'll be um, specific. They'll they'll work out what what, what antigens are, uh, are going to work best. They'll uh, you know delivery systems will improve. All the usual things. I mean, I, I could do I could do this in in, in, in any, any any hospital ward. I could take some poo, dilute it in some water or saline or whatever the recipe is and just run it in like a mini enema it's, it's a very simple thing that's no exactly drugs right. involved whatsoever that's exactly oh well we usually clear out the uh, uh we, we wash the well you just wash the column out get rid yeah. of all the bugs that are there and yeah. put the new ones in it's as simple as that. that's what yeah. we're doing here and, and you and i have both seen patients lives treated by professor tom Brody transformed by this yeah, that's right. You came along to one of our clinics. I, I, I met them and I was just, there was a patient who was going to get a total colectomy in England, taking out the whole colon. That's and basically, Tom Brody basically cured him by cleaning out his colon and putting in a few new bacteria. It was, it was startling. Well, look, look my, my introduction to uh, uh, this particular um, bug was when I, I was working as a, a junior professor at McMaster University in Canada and the, all the interns went on strike. <laughs> Gee, that, that was a long time ago, and uh, uh, so all, we all had to double up, and I had to become a. I had to go and help the surgeons uh, operate, and we had to do an emergency colectomy on a patient with exactly this this same uh, C. difficile infection, and other causes of, of of things like you know ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. It's just uh, the, the the effects are just quite yeah. incredible. Well, one thing that came to my mind there, Robert, um, very often I remember as soon as patients used to get viral infections, the doctors would come along and say, ooh, 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 you might get secondary bacterial infection, and they write them up for MagniPen or whatever the broad-spectrum antibiotic was at, at that time. Um, I'm assuming antibiotic therapy is going to disrupt the gut microbiome and potentially have significant adverse effects on our ability to generate uh, innate mucosal immunity? Yeah, it's a very good question. And, I mean, this is one of the problems that um, you have with the uh, fecal microbiome transplants, that you, um, uh, you don't want to be using antibiotics at the time because you don't want to destroy the good bacteria that you've just put in. Uh, I mean, I had a patient a couple of weeks ago, which was a huge dilemma because... Um, it was one of the rare ones that was working slowly and um, we didn't want to slow that down. But um, everyone said, well, you know, maybe there's still some C. difficile. We'll give them some oral vancomycin, which is the antibiotic, which is traditionally used, but not nearly as effective as FMT. So we had to tread very carefully as to we didn't want to destroy um, the, what the patient had probably paid a fair amount of money for and gone through quite a procedure. It's not a difficult procedure, really. No, not at all. And, and sometimes I think Tom also dries it out and uses it in capsules, doesn't it? So you get That's spores, right. he's now, uh, spores put from the bacteria that, yeah. that go in all the way through. So you can swallow it. And that, I keep telling him it makes most sense because those capsules will also, those bugs will stimulate the post patches on the way through. So you're actually, you're actually combining, doing exactly what we were talking about before, combining, stimulating the immune... The, the immunity and replacing the bad, bad bacteria mm. at the same time. And if they're enteric coated, that means that coating can take it through the acidity of the stomach to the alkalinity exactly. of the small bowel. Exactly. And, uh, and just be released at that, at, that, uh, at that particular point. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I, think, I think Tom's, I, I'm not sure, he's got, only got about a dozen or 20 uh, fecal donors. They're very carefully screened. Oh, uh, very obvious. much. They obviously, you know, check for all the all, yeah. all the basic, um, you know, potential well, infectious diseases, we're, we're, we're and it's a very safe treatment. Tom's been approached by blood banks saying, "Well, maybe we should start establishing fecal banks." You know, where, where you use that incredible uh, stringent uh, um, uh, assessment of of donors and specimens, you know, just as you would with blood, uh, you do with the faecal specimens. Uh, but we certainly test for all the resistant bacteria that you don't want to get. Um, and all the nasty things that you can possibly get are all tested in every donor regularly. Yeah. 
And part of the reason that some people are particularly healthy, you know, they've got an optimum weight, they've got good metabolic health, they've got good immune health, is because of this great microbiome. And uh, all they've got to do is give us some of the feces and they can share that with the world. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, yeah I think we're, we're at the edges of all of this. It's, it's very exciting. Um, and we haven't even touched on the metabolic changes, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, yeah. uh, a lot of the cerebral issues of yeah. change. And, you know, in the animal systems, by changing the FMT of a mother, you can actually influence the neural development of the, of the baby, the baby mouse or rat, depending on what you're looking at. Uh, and, of course, genetics are getting their ugly head in all of this. Uh, it's, well, who knows where it's all going to go? Yeah. I, I'd love to be 22 or 23 now, <laughs> having to look at what I'd do for a PhD. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's just going to be so exciting. Yeah. No, it, it really is quite... It changed, uh, changed the medical world. And, and you know, when I look at what we're doing, look, I get tired of going to gastroenterological meetings because I, I still see uh, people with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and every second, or no, two out of three, will be yet another monoclonal antibody that a big company's making its billions of dollars out of. And all they're doing, it's just like a sophisticated steroid. You're suppressing an inflammation rather than changing the basic nature of the disease. So we're starting to get to tin tacks at what yeah. is causing inflammatory bowel disease, systemic yeah. inflammation, um, f chronic fatigue syndromes. All of these things now are getting back to this microbiome, which yeah. as many people now consider as the, the new organ. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. They're, they're giving intravenous morphine. They're giving yeah. all sorts of sophisticated painkillers. Pain they're putting local anesthetics in the finger when all you need to do is pull the splinter out. <laughs> to get to get rid of the pain it's just it's just so basic and and absolutely there's uh, no money fundamental there's no yeah money. i know there's no money in pulling splinters out i know I've, i don't think i've ever got paid for one yet <laughs> having done several thousand probably more than that um so we've got got this new idea that's developing i like it it's i mean we've got things like the gut lung axis or the gut brain axis the, the gut and and potentially other mucosas even potentially genital mucosa is affecting the, the, the health of the overall other systems in the body that which we didn't know were, were linked in the past, but now do appear to be linked through this, what we could, what we can only call living in a natural ecosystem. You know, we, we are designed, we've evolved for all this time with, with these natural ecosystems. And the idea that you can somehow ignore that is 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 arrogant really because i mean in in my early early studies i mean bacteria were always seen as the enemy um the bad oh, guys that's right i mean if you go right back to the beginnings uh, back in 1900 <clears throat> when uh bacteria were first identified only 20 years earlier and and people said well look we've got this gut we've got good bacteria and bad bacteria and it was out of that concept that probiotics came yeah. And the first probiotic um, was in 1917 by a very smart German doctor called, and I don't know how to pronounce N-I-S-S-L-E, but Nizzle. Um, Nizzle yeah. And that E. coli that he found was a good bug, this particular E. coli, and he was using it to treat people with inflammatory bowel disease, is still available in the chemist shops today. Uh, I think it's called Mutaflor. And uh, it's still... and. and Studies have recently been done to show that it really does have a benefit in inflammatory bowel disease. So over a hundred years that's later, the pharma companies that's one hundred and ten years nearly. Yeah, uh, and the pharma you know, companies don't seem to have read that literature yet. So no, 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 it's not. A, it's very cheap. But th th this video, I'm sure, will put all the pharmaceutical industry executives straight <laughs> onto it because they want to optimise the health of all I'll human tell you, beings. The funny thing, John, is when they get sick, they're very happy to have it. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah. If you've if you've got some personal interest in the game, it uh, the Americans would say some skin in some skin in the game. It uh, yeah, that's right. It, uh, it, it the spirit is enlivened. Yeah, um, you, you mentioned yeah. the 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 gut lung axis. I, I don't I don't like to use that term. I, I, okay. I used to, but now I'm I'm thinking of uh, this common system. I, I, right. I'm very happy yeah. to see the yeah. the gut brain axis because yeah. I think here you're looking at uh, a mucosal. Uh, system involving immunity and the bugs, but it's influencing the rest of the body. Uh, it's influencing the brain, 
It's influencing the bloodstream, level of inflammation. We know that relates to coronary artery disease, cancer. All of these things now are starting to be looked at in terms of how can they be influenced well or badly by the microbiome. And the data base is, is quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah, no, the concept of a, of a common mucosal system, I agree. That is the, I think that's the optimum concept that we need to work on. And the, the mucus immune microbiome protection system yeah, needs to be optimized. You need to solve the common mucosal system yeah. and, and <laughs> leave out the bugs and leave out the immunity. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think maybe one of my takeaway messages here, Robert, is the idea that we want to optimize systemic immunity, of course. We want the vitamin D, we want good nutrition. All of all of those things, but now we need to optimise mucosal immunity as well, and um, you know have a, a high awareness of both of these systems and the importance of both of these systems. Yeah, I, I think I, I really think that that's going to be a huge thing over the next uh, X years, and yeah. and we've started with a single bug that yeah. is highly protective uh, in the airways. Um, we can see how that can be extended with more powerful bugs uh, to influence the gut. Um, and I think that what we're going to be doing, and I, I can nearly promise you, but I probably won't be around when it happens, but that people Boy. are going to select out a bug that they want to stimulate immunity to that will change diabetes, change yeah. Yeah. Um, the metabolic syndrome, change fuzzy brains and things, yeah. a chronic fatigue syndrome. We know, uh, we know all these things are occurring in, in those other systemic conditions. Yeah. And... It's just logical that this will happen. Yeah, yeah. We just need to learn these specific bacterial microbiological interventions. And at the moment, we know nothing about the human virome. I mean, there's viruses in there in the gut as well. We know virtually nothing about that. And we indeed, the, fu the, the fungome ten, as well. Ten times bigger than the bacterial microbiome. Mm. There are ten times as many. Well, mind you, they're much smaller too. Yeah, yeah. But the, the, the obviously ecosystems whether they're outside or inside us are there for a reason it's uh, um, more learning to come there and it, this ties in beautifully in my mind with, with Professor Dalglish, Angus Dalglish's work where, where he's actually injecting some uh, attenuated uh, heat killed bacteria. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely uh, um, what, what Gus is doing is um, taking uh, he, he's worked on this for many years mm. uh, and he's worked out a particular um, it's basically a, a TB look-alike bug and yeah. a product from that. But it, it, it works a bit differently. What, what I'm talking about when we were talking earlier about the T-cells being stimulated is highly specific. Yeah. Uh, what Gus is talking about is non-specific. He's stimulating all the T-cells. And a number of those will go and be active in a, a cancer substrate. Um, so... Um, what we I don't want to complicate things, but whenever we get a specific response, we get a little bit of non-specific response. Yeah. And Gus and I were talking about how we can start looking at screening different bugs that can have a, just the right amount of specific, the right amount of non-specific, ones that are creating the type of T-cell outcome that we want. Because different diseases uh, are demanding different patterns of immune responses. Yeah. And, and strangely, the regulatory authorities for medicines in my country have refused to license that uh, bacterial yeah, preparation that he's That's really developed. strange, isn't it? Really strange. Well, particularly very, very, when very you should just call it messenger RNA and then you don't even have to do preclinical work. Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost as if that, you know, they want to promote sophisticated, expensive treatments as opposed yeah. to treatments that work. But of course, but look, I mean, can I just make possibly know that? You and I uh, off air were, were talking a bit about... Um, messenger RNA and, and the fact we're talking about factories and developing I mean I wish I wished I could get some of the funds that's going in <clears throat> to messenger RNA factories there's a remarkable woman in Australia who uh, has chronicled all the money and where the money's come from and who's getting it in pretty much all the universities are getting multiple millions of dollars to create factories of messenger RNA Something that is not needed for vaccines, uh, they're never going to be better. They'll be maybe sometimes as good, but they bring huge, unsorted out adverse events. Uh, and yet it's sexy, it's patented, and you can charge you know, billions of dollars for, for, for 
and you can create a new vaccine a year. I mean, the latest is RSV. Um, uh, I, I hope I'm around long enough to, to have a, a proper assessment of the great value of that. I, I see that Pfizer's uh, flu vaccine failed this week, yeah. uh, thank God, because uh, the thought of having messenger RNA vaccines for flu is, is simply frightening, frightening. And yet, no, the, the, the RSV RNA has been, uh, the respiratory syncytial virus vaccine has been approved in the United States and Europe already. So it will be rolled out this but It's crazy. Autumn. I wonder if they've ever read the history of vaccination in RSV. Uh, I, strongly not. Suspect, I strongly suspect not. Yeah. Professor, as always, um, <laughs> to, 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 I get two emotions with these videos. Well, one is completely fascinating, absolutely amazing how 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 sophisticated it is and yet these are these are completely natural designed you know evolved systems it's just so beautiful and so simple and the other emotion i get is just absolute outrage that you know humanity has denied That's these right. wonderful treatments that our cleverest doctors have invented for us but but the riffraff like 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 you and me in this case aren't allowed them because the regulators don't approve them it's just well well no it's not a question the regulators will improve it uh, right. um, it's just that uh, well G G gus is they didn't approve well, they, they, they haven't approved have that the, one. you know the relatively small amount of money to put it through we're, we've yeah. got the whole thing done it's it's yeah. it's um it's not well you know Knowing the regulators, these well, I would be careful. I've got to be nice to them, haven't I? Yeah, we have to be nice. <laughs> Gus's bacterial preparation that he used. Uh, yeah, he they, was, they, they, they won't. They won't license it because if it, if it was licensed, it, doctors could prescribe it compassionately. That's right. Can't they? Can't, they can't. Only Gus. Gus is the only person who can use it. Is is he? Um, I, I think it's only in the context of. Uh, you'd have to ask us about that. I think it, I think it's, it's used in the context of trials. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not made. It's impressive. not made available in BNF because oh, it was yes, in BNF that, that, that people yeah. could just prescribe it compassionately. And because it, it's got quite impressive database. No, oh, I would have it straight away. You know, why wouldn't you want to reduce your chances of infection, boost your immune system, and reduce your chances of probably most common cancers? Yeah. Probably. Well, when he was out, out here, we, we had a, a delightful dinner and yeah, we were talking about the various other things we could use that same sort of product for, yeah, uh, not absolutely. just cancer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right, let's hope someone's listening. Uh, but uh, for the people that have listened all the way through, well done. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Professor Clancy, as always. A great, great, to, a, a great pleasure, John. Thank you for having me. Great to talk. Yeah, thank you.